to pastor such a phenomenal army of believers. We have tens and tens and tens of thousands of people that worship with us around the world every single Sunday. And because of you, because of your seeds of sacrifice, because of your serving and your sowing, your prayers, we're able to push through and keep presenting Jesus to the rest of this world. And if you haven't figured it out, we need a savior. Uh, maybe you didn't watch the news. Maybe you haven't seen what's happening around you. Maybe it hadn't hit your hood. Maybe it hadn't knocked on the doorstep of your own house. But in case you missed it, we need a savior. This world needs a savior. And I found the savior. I found the one that can. I found the redeemer. I found the keeper, the sustainer, the protector, the provider. I found the one that is our peace. He is our love. He is our joy in the weakest and the most downturn moment. I found the Savior. Maybe you found him too. And just in case you haven't, Victory Walker's in here. Tell him who the Savior is. His name is? Come on, shout it like you know who you're talking about. His name is? name is Jesus. This is my father's favorite hymn. If you'll indulge me, I just want to sing just a piece of it. Let me see if I can find the key, Jason. When peace like a river attendeth my way. You can sing with me. When the sorrows like sea billows roll sea billows Whatever my lot, come on, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, what? Come on, lift it up over here. Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is with my soul. Sometimes you have to just encourage yourself, just say, it is well with my soul. Say it is well, it is with right here but I think it's powerful the words just say though Satan should buffet though trials should come let this blessed assurance control number of psalms a familiar passage of scripture everybody knows it we've rehearsed it we recited it we remembered it it is probably one of the most popular scriptures that we 
collectively and corporately acknowledge on a regular basis. So I don't have to introduce many of you to it, but I don't want to be presumptuous to think that everybody has it. So we're going to read it together from the King James Version. I want to read it aloud. I want all of us sing it together because I think what we need more than ever right now is what David has given us in the gift of this particular psalm. In the 23rd number of Psalm, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. He maketh me to lie down in he leadeth, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Let, let's hit that sixth verse one more time. I, I, I like the way you said it. Let's do it one more time. And surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, it's a preachable moment and I can't do it without you. Speak through me and to me. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit take over, take authority of this movement, this moment, this atmosphere. I ask God that you would give me grace to be able to carry the burden of this particular task. This is a lofty and a weighty assignment, but I know your grace is sufficient. And I ask God that you give me the kind of anointing that makes preaching easy and listening easier, that ultimately you kill our ignorance with your truth. Speak to us in a way that is palpable, that is, that is living and alive, causes this word to live within us so that we can live for you. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's put a seal on it that the devil can't break. In Jesus' name. Somebody like you know what God is about to do is incredible. Shout hallelujah. I know it takes great faith, but if you know God is able, shout thank you, Jesus. And somebody say amen. You may be seated in the presence of our awesome God. If you just joined us, if you've not been here all month, we've been trying to get this message into your heart, into your head, into your hearing. And here it is. It's real simple. It's okay. Tell the people around you, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. No, you know, act like you want to comfort them. You, just, that was, you had a little attitude with it. It's okay. No, 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 no. Come on. Be nice to them. Come on. Be nice to them. Just say, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to not be okay. And I know a lot of people, I saw it a lot on the social media this week because of all the things. And, and, and I know this was one incident, but this seems to be a perpetual thing that we're contending with, that the enemy is showing himself in phenomenal ways that seems even more brazen and bold than we've witnessed in the past. However, because I know the word of God is true, I know it's not anything new. That he has always and consistently been who he is. And done what he's doing. If you go all the way back to Cain and Abel. You see some of the same evil. You see some of the same dastardly deeds that have been done since the beginning of time. And the Bible tells us that there is nothing new under the sun. So what we're now doing is we're seeing a new face or a new manifestation or a new strategy on an old demonic tactic. It's not something that. Is foreign to us. It's not something that we have not witnessed before. As a matter of fact, the Bible makes clear to give us a warning and to let us know that the enemy is coming. And this is what he's coming to do. Kill, steal, and destroy. So we should think it not strange concerning all of these fiery trials. But it does not change the emotional toll that it takes on people. And every single one of us has to contend with this reality that there are moments in our lives when we're just not okay. And so God gave me this assignment and I didn't know any of this was going to transpire in this month. That we were going to witness the, the massacre in Buffalo, the, the, the children in Texas. I didn't know any of these things were going to happen. But God gave me the assignment months ago that this month, 
even including, I didn't know that this was Emotional Health Awareness Month. I had no idea when the assignment fell upon my heart. But God gave me this awesome task of being able to help us understand that it's okay to not be okay. In addition to Dr. Anita Phillips, who is a world-renowned uh, trauma therapist and an incredible uh, individual, a minister of the gospel and a podcast that is global in its scope, she did an amazing job at at reminding us even further with giving, by giving us clinical evidence laced with the scriptural uh, uh, release to acknowledge to ourselves and to others that it's okay to not be okay. But as I intimated and as I began last Sunday, I've got to carry that message that I gave, the addendum that I gave last Sunday a little bit further. It's okay to not be okay, but it is not okay to stay there. Are you with me? Here's why, because Bible says, in, uh, God says in the Bible, he says, Beloved, above all my desire is that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. That's why we've given you strategies and tactics and tools to use, and we've admonished you and pushed you to go get some counseling, some therapy, some help. Go hug somebody if you have to, because we do not want you to stay in the place where the enemy is, is wreaking havoc upon and ransacking your thoughts, taking authority over your, uh, the seat of your emotions, and you're not living the abundant life. Abundance is not just tangible increase, but the abundant life that Jesus came to give his life for is abundance of joy, abundance of peace, abundance of all the things that he desires for us to experience in him. And God, Jeremiah 29, 11, makes it clear that my, th my thoughts are, are not to harm you, but to give you a hope and to give you a future. So God does not desire for us to stay in a place of not being okay, even though he gives us permission to acknowledge that there are times when we're not okay. So in pushing us forward, moving us out of the place of complacency and getting us to a place and a posture where we realize that we cannot stay here, I had to take it a step further. And this Psalm is an incredible opportunity for all of us to see where we are, but more importantly, to see where God is in the equation so that we can be where he desires for us to be. Every one of us has some stress triggers. And I don't know if any of you can testify, but uh, all my days have not been peachy keen. All my days have not been calm, cool, and collected, but I've had some stressful moments. Is there anybody else that can testify you've had some stressful moments? Yeah, all of you who have children should have raised your hand. Because in this day and age, if you drop them off at school, you've had some stressful moments. Now I understand why every time my children got out of the car, we had to have prayer before they left. To keep me sane in the process of waiting. Everyone has stressful moments and everyone has even stressful triggers. And I was alarmed to note that 40% of U.S. workers admit to experience stress in the office. And that is the leading, one of the leading points of, of, of interest as it relates to the stress factors or stress triggers that we deal with. One quarter of them say the biggest source of their stresses. And the 40% of people that say workplace is their stressor, their greatest stressor. One quarter of them says that that's the most prominent point of stress. Things like being unhappy on the job or having a workload that's too much, too much responsibility, working long hours, being insecure about whether or not you're going to have a job tomorrow, facing discrimination, harassment, uh, especially if your company is not supportive of dealing with these things head on. These are common causes of workplace stress. But it doesn't stop there. There's also stressors that affect you personally. Life stresses can also have a big impact. I know, I know many of us can testify that we've been through some of these stressful moments uh, where it was perpetuated or caused by the death of a loved one. You just didn't know how you were going to make it from this moment to the next. Divorce. There's so many people that, that have experienced this dynamic that now have, to have, have had to live through the stress of trying to figure out what is the new of your life. What is the tomorrow of your life look like? Losing a job, 
increasing financial obligations. And, and, and whether you realize it or not, getting married can be stressful. <laughs> it's amazing how many people struggle through the first year which many people testify is the hardest year because you have to now assimilate the philosophies, the experience and exposure of two individuals where they have to now collectively become as one. And so if you are getting married, your, your getting married can be a stress point for you. Doesn't mean you can't make it through it. Let me help you all out because I might have some first timers in here. See that pastor said it's stressful. We probably shouldn't have done this. <laughs> moving into a new home, a new territory, a new city, a new job, anything new, chronic illness, injury. These are major stresses. Family illness, the aging of parents, having to be caregiver. These are stressful things, emotional problems, depression, anxiety, anger, grief, guilt, low self-esteem. All of these things are huge stressors. This is one of the things I want to note and point out is that sometimes the stress comes from the inside rather than the outside. Because you can stress yourself out just by worrying about all the things that I just gave you on that list. So all of these factors can be stressful and a lot of times we think that if we remove the external factors, we will get rid of the internal stress. But you can remove the external factors. However, if it still resonates in your mind, if it still rests on your heart, you will still have the same level of stress and anxiety. For example, you can quit the job and still be stressed because you're worried about what they're going to say about you on your old job or if you're going to find a new job to replace it or if you're going to like the one that you found. So you got to note that the, the work that has to be done is not existential. But the first work that has to be done is intrinsic or internal. If you don't deal with the internal dynamic, then you're never going to have peace on the outside. Why is that, Pastor? Because wherever you go, there you are. Put that where you can feel it. Wherever you take yourself, you take whatever you have on the inside of you. And the stress and the worry and the anxiety might be triggered by things on the outside. But the peace that you are looking for has to exist on the outside, on the inside. Here's what I want to help you with. Many people think that peace is the absence of chaos. When in actuality, peace involves the presence of chaos. <laughs> help us, Holy Ghost. Come in, come closer. No child left behind. I got you. Peace is not the absence of chaos. Peace is the ability to be in the middle of chaos and still keep a level head, a calm spirit, and be eased in your heart. That's what real peace looks like. Real peace looks like a storm on the outside, but a calm on the inside. Real peace looks like everybody else is losing their mind, but you got your heels kicked up saying, I know the Lord will make a way somehow. The factors that we have to contend with, the things that we have to deal with, what we've got to wrestle with in order to get to a place of, okay, we've got to deal with what's happening on the inside. Fear and anxiety. Attitudes and perceptions. Unrealistic expectations. Change. All of these things are, are things that we are perpetuating, that we are continuing, that we are feeding on the inside. We go through these stresses because of the dynamics of, of these moments. And when stress becomes long term, let me help you understand that there are some dastardly, demonic, there's some deadly outcomes that can be the result of long term stress. That's why we have to deal with this now. Long term is not, if it's not properly addressed, long term stress can be more serious than many of us even realize. You can end up in depression, high blood pressure, abnormal heartbeat or arrhythmias, hardening of your arteries, arteriosclerosis from stress, from stress, 
heart disease, heart attack, heartburn, ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome, upset stomach, cramps, constipation, diarrhea, weight loss, weight gain, changes in your sex drive, fertility problems, flares up of asthma, arthritis, skin problems, acne, eczema, psoriasis, taking care of elderly and sick family members, traumatic events, natural disasters, theft, rape, violence against you or your loved ones, all of these things can be triggered by simple stress that you do not resolve or deal with on the inside. How in the world do we end up wrestling with all of these health issues when some of the simple fixes that can help us remedy our circumstance is not what we get on the outside, it's not what we take, it's not who we see or even talk to, but some of these can be fixed by talking to ourselves. Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor, talking to yourself? Some of this you're going to have to deal with the man in the mirror. Sometimes the hardest thing for you to fix is you. Oh, I knew this wasn't going to be popular preaching right through here, but it's all good. I brought a few amens for myself. Preach, boy. I love this psalm, and I'm a fan of David. A psalm of David used to recount his time as a shepherd. Because David in this text has now come to the latter portions of his life. He's now king. He's now reflecting upon the time when he was a shepherd boy out in the field. And in this text, he gives us some phenomenal insight to how to deal with the person on the inside so that we can have a better outcome on the outside. Oh, I'm going to help heal some people's hearts today. Thank you, Holy Ghost. God's going to restore some stuff in your life today. Everything that the canker worms, that the locust worms, that the locusts, that the palmer worms have eaten, God says, I will restore unto you. And so I'm believing that today God is about to speak through this text and give somebody exactly what you needed even when you didn't know you needed. You thought, it, you, you thought you needed another pill. You thought it was going to take something on the outside. But God says, no, I'm going to do some work on the inside and then we'll wrestle with what you got to deal with on the outside after that. This is a psalm of David. It is a lesson of our ability to have relativity with God. And so when I read this psalm again, I've read it a million and one times. But when I read it again, God says, I got new revelation that I need to share with you. Because you think that this is a psalm of confidence. But it's actually not a psalm of confidence. It's a psalm of one of the most dynamic things that is necessary in order for you to have a healthy outcome. Some theologians have concluded that this is likely written during the time when he was king. And so it was, it was actually David sitting on the throne reflecting and reminiscing from whence he had come. He had gotten to the point where he was now one of the most powerful men in the, in, the, in the world, in the nation, and he was definitely the king of the nation. So he had final say, he had authority, but he didn't forget where he came from. Because where he came from reminded him of the God that brought him and who God is in his own life. So in, in, in having this moment of reflection, this recount, he readily acknowledged that just as was the case with himself, he had been the younger brother and had been given the task that was beneath everybody else. In culture, in society, it wasn't one of the first vocational things that people ran towards to be a shepherd. It was actually one of the least preferred tasks and was typically given to the younger brother and sent on the backside of the field in the middle of nowhere. It wasn't something that everybody says, oh my goodness, can I be the shepherd? Can I be the shepherd? No, it was no, no, I'm older than him. He need to go be the shepherd. And so having the undesirable dynamic intact, it meant that if God is relative and God in his relativity takes the role of shepherd in our lives, then in actuality what God is doing is humbling himself to get close enough to us to take care of us when it seems like it would be the most undesirable position for somebody who was in a position or posture of authority. So just like David is the king, 
we're dealing with God who is the king of all kings. And just like David lowered himself to the role of caring for sheep, he says, now I can see that God has lowered himself to care for some sheep like you and I. The great God of the universe, I like the way the theologian Boyce says it, the great God of the universe has stooped to take just such care of you and me. If that doesn't give you some level of confidence, that the God who created everything would lower himself to take care of some lowly sheep on the backside of nowhere, then I don't know what gives you confidence. I have such a great deal of appreciation for God who created the universe. Everything is hinged upon his word. His authority is matchless and knows no boundaries. He created by simply saying, let there be. We're talking about the one who is the divine authority. The same God that puts all things in order and orchestrates all things. And from his word, he speaks and everything became this God who is so divine, so majestic, so authoritative that he is from everlasting to everlasting everlasting and vacillates on a spectrum of eternity and does not have to deal with the hiccup of time. He simply is God all by himself. He is a magnificent God whose splendor fills the heavens and whose glory permeates the atmosphere of everything that exists. The same God that can close the curtain on a night and still cause a baby to intimately come to life. The same God that causes the dew drops to dance on the lips of the lily in the morning time. The same God that puts thunder in the neck of a horse and causes him to leap like a locust across the field. The same God who knows where the storehouses of rain and the storehouses of hell they're held up in the heavens and causes them to pour wherever. I'm talking about this is the magnificent incredible, infamous omniscient, omnipresent I, w I wish I had somebody that knows who your God is. This is the great I am that I am everything you need I am this is the same God that reaches down and takes care of some sheep like you and me if that doesn't make you say God thank you I don't know what will that you would take the time to deal with sheep is amazing so here David is making, the, he's making an argument of relativity in his mind and says, wow, I remember I'm king, but I remember where I came from. I had to deal with sheep, lowly, ignorant, silly, unwise sheep, sheep that I had to live with because a real shepherd smells like sheep. Sheep that I had to be engaged with on a regular basis. And he says, wow, what an amazing thing. Because out of this text, one of the greatest weapons, one of the strongest tools, one of the commanded strategies for dealing with what's happening on the inside. Because every day of David's life was not full of peace and calm. David was a warring king, so much so that he didn't even have the authority to build the temple because God says you got too much blood on your hands. So his fight, his fights were outside, but watch this, some of David's greatest songs were written in the middle of him fighting on the inside. He was having some mental moments where he had to do battle on the inside with himself in order to be able to deal with what he had to deal with on the outside. We, wor we, we worship using the Psalms of David, but what we don't understand is that what we used to worship was actually his warfare. Oh, bless his name. So he had tapped in and said one of the greatest weapons the strongest tools 
and the commanded strategies for dealing with what I got to deal with in this world and finding peace on the inside so I can do what God has assigned me to do. Watch this. It's going to throw you. You're not ready for it because you think that it's going to be your praise. It's going to be your worship. It's going to be your singing. It's going to be your dancing. David danced until he danced out of his clothes. He was a praiser. He was a worshiper. He played the harp. He was a musician. You think that it's going to be one of these tactics, but David tapped into something that many of us are going to miss if we don't pay attention and if we don't sit down and plot right in this text. So I got it. Y'all want to know the answer? Come closer. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. I know you're waiting on it. It's right here. It's right here. This is the solution. This is how you're going to, and get this, it's a commanded strategy. It's not even something that's optional. God gave it to you as a command because he knew how powerful it is. One of the greatest weapons you have in order to get yourself together and be able to deal with this stuff on the outside and get to a place of okay. Here it is. It's just rest. I know y'all waiting on this big ball drop, this big aha moment. It's simply rest. Do you realize that rest is on the same do not list as murder and adultery? The Sabbath, he says, in, in, on the Sabbath, keep it holy. For on six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh, he what? If God has to rest. If God took a rest, what makes you think you can keep functioning without rest? I know that I know that that's not heavy and deep because you were like you were waiting on some theological ecclesial uh, this scholarly bit of advice, but it's as simple as what God has already commanded. He said, "Listen, in it you shall do no work. Your manservant, your maidservant, your ox, your ass, the cattle within your gates." For in six days he made heaven and earth, and seventh day he rested and he blessed it and he hallowed it. He said, "You have to have a holy day, a Sabbath day, a rest day." Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. A lot of what you're wrestling with is because you haven't learned how to. Can I just, you know, I, I got to preach from a place of own, my own experiential knowledge. What I figured out. Rest is not being still. And rest is not even being quiet. And rest is not taking phone calls. Rest is not just, you know, I'm asleep. Rest is a spiritual dynamic. It is a soul refreshing moment. It's not emptying out, it's filling back up. A lot of us think if we empty our calendar, clear our schedule, remove things from our day, then we can rest. But real rest is when you are replenished, refreshed, revived, renewed, so you can be restored. Here it is, I'm done. Here it is. Let's just walk through the psalm. David in his contemplation says, well, I see you, God, and I hear you clearly. So he made this definitive declaration. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. He walked us through the process and the steps of being assured of who God is and who we are in God so that we could rest in our soul. The Lord is my shepherd. I love the fact that he admonishes us that it is not a God over there, but he's the God or a shepherd who's right here. He did not use a pronoun. He used a personal pronoun. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. In other words, he says, God, I see the relativity and how my story relates to how you function with us. You have established us as your people. In other words, we are your prized possession. 
Sheep were not just something that just existed, but sheep were raised. They were developed. They were grown. They were groomed. They were fed. They were cared for. In other words, sheep had people. And just like sheep had a shepherd or how sheep have a shepherd, we are God's people and we have a shepherd. We've got someone who meets our needs when we don't have sense enough to know how to meet our needs. For I, I feel like I'm going to preach this thing. I'm trying to keep myself together. But when I think about how much he cares for me, when I don't even know I need caring for, how he provides every single thing that I need when I need it. I've got a shepherd and he's got his people. He's not just a shepherd. I didn't just say he's your shepherd. Let me talk about Smokey. He is my shepherd. He's my covering. He's my shield. He's my protector. He's my defender. He's my warrior. When I'm hungry, he feeds me. When I'm thirsty, he feeds me. He gives me drink. When I'm lost, he leaves me. He's my shepherd. If that doesn't give you some rest, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Then he goes on to say, and I shall not want. Not only does he establish us as his people, but he deals with our panic. Many of you are stressed because you are worried about your increase. You are worried about your provision. You are worried about how you're going to eat, how you're going to make it, how you're going to make ends meet, how you're going to get through this season, how you're going to get back on track, how you're going to get through tomorrow. But the God that I serve gave me this dynamic truth. He says, I'm not only your shepherd, but because I'm your shepherd, you shall not want y'all missed it that means you're not going to lack anything no good thing shall I withhold from them that love me don't you think that I'm going to supply all of your needs the Lord is my shepherd because of that this is going to give you some rest tonight you shall not what? Oh, let me sit there for a second. You will lack nothing. God's got you covered. God's provision will make ways out of no ways. You will lack nothing. No good thing shall he withhold. You shall not want. Let me just take three seconds because somebody... Ah. Somebody needed to hear that right now. You didn't think it was going to come together. You've been stressed about how it was going to work out. You didn't know how you were going to make ends meet. You can't see how he was going to pull it off, how he was going to put it together. But God sent me to remind you today that he's the God that meets needs. And the fact that you have identified a need means that he's obligated to honor his word. You said, and my God shall, not maybe, not perhaps, not shall should but shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. You will lack nothing. I gotta speak it until you feel it. You will lack nothing. You will lack nothing. You will lack nothing. Lord, I'm going to try to make it through this, y'all. He's my shepherd. And because of that, let me tell you what's going to help you rest tonight. You shall not want. David, David goes on and says, he maketh. Yeah, let's talk about it for a minute. He maketh me lie down you ever had I remember I remember when my boys were younger sometimes we had to make them lie down he maketh me to lie down watch this in green pastures I need you to understand green 
Thank you, Holy Ghost. Green, uh, green symbolizes and represents plenty, affluence, enough, even more than enough, abundance. When things are green, when the earth is green, when the grass is green, that means things are good. So the question that, bef that befuddles me is how and why would he have to make me lie down if things are good? Eh. Why? Here it is, here it is, because you've gotten so used to stressing that you don't even know how to appreciate good. It has become the culture and the cultural norm of your thought process. You don't even know how to appreciate good. So he maketh you lie down because you feel like when it's good, you should keep going because you don't want to lose what's good. It really is an evidence of your lack of confidence in the God who is the source because you are so focused on the resource. He maketh me. And I don't ever like God to have to make me. I want to get rest myself. I got to fix those things on the inside because I don't want to, please don't make me because sometimes when he makes you, he, he makes you. Anybody ever had God have to make you stop something? Make you not go somewhere? Make you quit a job? Come on somebody. Make you leave some folk behind? Make the friendships end and dissipate? Cause some stuff to be stripped away because you didn't have courage and boldness or emotional fortitude to strip it away yourself? I don't need God to make. I'm, I got it Lord. I got it. I got it Lord. I got it. I, 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 I got it. I got it. Don't, you don't have to make me. I'm going to rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Watch this. And then he leads me beside still waters. He leads me beside still waters. Here's what I want you to understand about God making you lie down. Uh, sheep don't lie down easily. There's a book called A Shepherd's Look at Psalms 23. And it literally gives you a depiction of the lifestyle and the, and the psyche and the psychological and emotional conditions or state of a sheep. And sheep don't lie down easily. You, you, you sometimes have to make them lie down because they, here's, here's four reasons why they don't lie down easily. First of all, because they're timid. They don't lie down if they're afraid. They're also social animals, so they won't lie down if it's some friction among the other sheep. They won't lie down. If there are flies or parasites troubling them and nipping at their ears and biting on their nose, they won't lie down. You have to make them lie down. Finally, if sheep are anxious about food, if they're stressed about hunger, they will not lie down. So rest comes because you know that the shepherd has already dealt with your fear, your friction, your flies, and your famine. When you are stressed, it's because you don't believe that the shepherd the good shepherd has already covered your fears, your friction, your flies, and your famine. I wish I had time. I just can't break it down. I don't have time to get into it right now. But many of us are wrestling with fear and anxiety over what's next, what's coming, what could happen. We paint pictures in our head of things that will never exist. And it's because we have not trusted that the God who is in charge of everything has already given us a confidence. But this bad thing is going to happen. But this could take a turn. But this, but when you know that 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 you know you can say and we know all the stuff that might happen is still going to turn around and work for my good so I'm going to kick my heels up and everybody else can panic around me and sound the alarm and put on bells and whistles but I'm going to say well let's pray together pray about it and let's leave it in the Lord's hands because it's still going to work in my favor and the friction God will handle your enemies you you let your enemies be who they are over there. Stop firing back on social media. Stop coming down off your perch to get down on the ground.
around with people who are ground dwellers. I'm trying to help y'all out right here. You got to stop hanging out in low places when God says, I'll handle your friction. That smoke belongs to me. This battle ain't yours. I got this thing. You ain't got to open your eye. I will uphold you with my right hand of righteousness and everyone that curses you will have to deal with me. He handles your flies. You got parasites, so you can't sleep because you don't trust nobody around you. God says, I got your flies. Don't worry about them. He handles your famine. Even in the middle of a drought, you made it. Through a pandemic, you made it. Through people dying all around you, you made it. Through you losing your job, you made it. Through folk walking out of your life, you made it. And you don't think he can handle your famine? God says, I got you. You have to trust God. Uh, it's that simple. You have to trust. You gotta. You have to trust God. You have to trust Him with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. You have to trust God. You have to trust God. You just have to trust. You have to have confidence. You have to be able to say, God's got it. You got to be bold enough. You got to be brave enough. You got to be courageous. He says, be strong and courageous. Be very courageous. You have to be courageous enough to say, God, I don't understand it, but I trust you. It doesn't make sense, but I trust you. It hurts, but I trust you. I'm confused, but I trust you. I don't see how, but I trust you. I don't know what. I don't know when, and I can't tell you where, but I trust you. You have to trust God. God turns the corner and the rest of the psalm, he gives you some assurances. He says, let me, I know, I know I gave you a lot, so let me help you get to the place of rest. Let me help you rest. Let me help you rest. I want to help you rest. I want to help you rest. I want to help your soul rest. I want to help your soul rest. He says, listen, this is why I need you to sit down. This is why I need you to chill. This is why I need you to understand what I've already told you, that you shall not want. This is why I need you to have confidence in me. That's why I need you to trust me. Here it is. This is why, because I've given you some promises. And when God gives you a promise, he cannot take it back. He cannot change it. It is a contract and it is a covenant of his truth. When he speaks, it becomes as he has spoken it. And it is what he has said. And when you know this and you have this confidence, he says, so let me remind you in this text of my promises. First of all, he promises you help. He says, I want you to rest. I made you lie down. I made you get to a posture where you could hear so that I can restore it, your soul. Many of you have been trying to restore your financial condition. But God says, get your soul right and your finances will line up. You've been trying to restore your health. He said, when your soul is healthy, the rest of you will come into agreement with the truth that I have already spoken. I was wounded for your transgressions. I was bruised for your iniquity, the chastisement of your pieces upon me. And by my stripes, you are already healed. But if your soul is not rested, if your soul ain't right, then the rest of you cannot be right either. Why do you say this, Pastor? Because your soul is the most important part of your existence. How so, Pastor? Because your soul is breathed into you by God. Your soul is the source of every achievement of your life. If you don't believe me, just look at a corpse. A corpse is, is without soul. And it is simply left body. And so a corpse can't do anything else in this life. But your soul is what was causing that corpse, which was at that time a body that was full of life, to be able to achieve and accomplish and do all the things that have been done. That's why we grieve over a shell, but the soul is not there. It has ascended from that body and it will spend eternity. This is why the soul is important, either in torment or in paradise, depending on what that soul did while it was in that body. Did it receive Jesus or it? Jesus that's why the soul is the most important part of your existence your soul lasts forever so why do you spend so much time trying to fix your fleshly situation and you ignore your soulish situation 
You've been feeding the things that make you comfortable on the outside. But God says you got to start taking time to feed what makes you who you are on the inside. He says, I'll rest I want to restore your soul and I'll lead you in the path of righteousness. In other words, you'll be upright with me. To be righteous is to be right standing with God. So I'm trying to get you right, but I can't get you right because you won't take care of your soul. You would rather feed your flesh your favorite television show than feed your, your soul your favorite scriptural passages. Yeah. You would rather have a social media presence than you will have a spiritual presence in worship with me. You would rather spend your time talking to your friends than hanging out with the friend that will be there when your fake, fickle, phony friends walk off, betray you, and leave you high and dry. Take care of your soul, and I'll take care of your standing. He restored my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So he promises to help, but then he turns the corner and he promises to be a safe haven because he says, yea, though, David said, I know I'm walking through the valley of shadow of death. Even though it's going to be moments when death is all around me. Even though it's going to be moments when I have to walk through some dark places. Even though it's going to be moments when I have to go through some downturns and some dark times. I will fear no evil. For thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. First thing I need you to notice is that he didn't say, yea, though I walk through the death. Yea, though I walk through the valley. He said, yea, though I walk not through the valley of death, but I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The only reason you have a shadow is because a shadow is a figment or a partition of something that's not real. Help me, Holy Ghost. Because here's the thing. Jesus took the full reality of death and he took it in our place. So we only contend with what is a shadow of death. If it is a shadow, it's not real. It just looks like or reflects from something that is real. And the only time you have a shadow is when you have the existence of light that is casting on something else and the shadow is the offcast of something that exists on the other side and it's not real. It's not tangible. You can't touch it. You can't grab it you can't hold it but it only happens if there is the existence of light y'all missed it thank you Holy Ghost so when you have a shadow it's because you have the S-U-N no the S-O-N who is real and is shining on your life and there is a shadow that is cast watch this behind you because if you face the sun the shadow will show up on the other side and it is not real walk through the valley of the shadow of death I don't have to be afraid it ain't real what you gonna do to me my soul is secure my soul is anchored it ain't real I don't have to be afraid God hadn't given me a spirit of fear but of love power and so I don't fear the evil of this world because I know I just gotta walk through and I, and I don't even have to sit down I just walk through the valley I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And I don't have to fear because God, you're with me. Your rod and your staff. Uh, do I have time? Y'all got a few more minutes to give me right here. Yeah, let me give you some context here. Let me break this down. I didn't mean to give y'all this much. But there's an there's a, a argument between theologians as to whether the rod and the staff are two distinct things in the Hebrew language. And they have two different meanings. But they don't know uh, definitively if the rod and staff is referring to one thing or it's referring to two things. However, the meaning of each is not arguable. Everybody contends and agrees and Seize on the reality of what the, the rod and the staff actually did. The staff was the equivalent of a walking stick. In the Hebrew language, it means walking stick. And so the staff uh, was, was, was a stick in, in which the shepherd used to prop himself and to, and to walk. But it was also the stick that he used to defeat the animals or the beasts, the wolves that would come in and try to take the sheep. So he would use the staff to fight off any predators that came to destroy the sheep, which gives you the evidence 
evidence of why you don't have to fear because when the wolves come in when the bears come in when the lions and the tigers try to attack your life and your family and your bloodline and your peace and your joy God says I have a stick called a staff and I will battle for you you ain't even got to lift the finger this battle don't even belong to you I'll take care of your enemy I've got this and then he uses the hook of the other side to pull you back in to redirect you to guide you so you don't hurt yourself so not only will he keep something else from hurting you but God says I love you so much I'm not even gonna let you hurt yourself he promises help he promises to be a safe haven but he also promises to be a host Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Anytime you have an enemy, you also have a table. Let that sit in for a second. Anytime you have an enemy, God will give you a table. The reason that's important is because the table is symbolic of you having plenty, having enough, or having a feast in their face. So if you have an enemy, you should thank God because it also means you have a table. He can't prepare a table in front of your enemy if your enemy ain't there to watch you eat. So the fact that your enemy has raised their head, you ought to start looking for the banquet somewhere close. Oh, that means if they're attacking me like this, that means that my table is spread. There's plenty of bread. There's plenty of meat. There's plenty of drink. There's plenty of everything that I need. If they coming at me this way, there's a table somewhere close. Increase. Got my name on it. Favor's about to fall in my household. My joy is about to be restored. My peace is about to come back. I'm getting the promotion. The elevation is mine. If my enemies are hitting me like this, then I got to table somewhere close I prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy watch this thou anointest my head with oil and my cup runneth over thou anointest my head with oil and my cup runneth over when I was growing up in Arkansas we used to go fishing with my grandparents and we didn't have the fancy rod and reel that everybody has now I don't know how many of y'all country or have any exposure to the country life but we use cane poles. Anybody know what a cane pole is? Let me help you out. It's just simply a long piece of cane that had been cut at the base and they would tie string, cut a slot in the top, tie string around it. They would put string on it. They put a barber on it, put a hook on it and they had a worm farm in a big refrigerator sitting in the backyard. I know that's real country for some of y'all but it worked for us. And when we would get ready to go out and go fishing, some of y'all go fishing and you grab your boats. You grab your fancy reels that cost thousands of dollars. You got your fancy gear, you got stuff that smell good on this fake worm that you drop in this water. But all we had was our cane poles. Watch this, a white bucket. You had to have a bucket to sit on and you had to have a bucket that you could drop your fish in. Sometimes you catch some perch, sometimes you catch some buffalo. But whatever you caught, you caught it with your cane pole. Here's the problem. We didn't have a boat. We couldn't afford the fancy boats that took us out in the middle of the water. So when we fished, we had to fish at the water's edge. If you know anything about being in tall grass in the middle of the south with a hundred degree heat in the middle of the country, standing by a huge body of water, you were also going to have to deal with some snakes. So what my grandmother would do before we got ready to go out and go fishing and had to go down by the water where the snakes would be sometimes, they would take something that they call coal oil. In other words, it was kerosene or coal oil and they would put it on our ankles, on our pants, on either side. 
They would make sure that the scent of coal oil was around our ankles really good. And I couldn't understand why every time we got ready to go fishing and go down by the water's edge, they had to put some coal oil or kerosene around our ankles. So one day I asked my granddaddy, I said, Papa, I don't understand why we got to put this stuff on our pants. I don't like the way it makes me smell. He said, son, you need to put that stuff on. I said, Papa, I don't really want to put this stuff on. He said, the reason you put that stuff on is because it keeps the snakes away from your ankles. Well, here's the problem. I was too young to even realize that I was supposed to be afraid of the snakes. And so even in my ignorance, come on somebody, even in my stupidity, even in my ignorance, my noviceness, even in my youth, and not even knowing that snakes were a danger to me, and that ultimately what they were putting around me was to help me to deal with the threat of snakes coming in our vicinity because they would smell the coal oil and it acted as a repellent to them. Well, I heard Bishop Jakes tell this story. He said that once he talked to a, a shepherd and when he had a conversation with the shepherd, he realized the meaning behind thou anointest my head with oil, which simply meant that the shepherd had to protect the sheep even when the sheep didn't know the sheep were in trouble. Why do you say that, pastor? Because sheep are so stupid sometimes that they will put their nose into holes that are in the ground where the snakes are coiled up and curled and waiting to snap them. But when they anointed their head with oil, y'all missed it the oil acted as a repellent just like it did with my granddaddy when he put it around my ankles so whenever they would stick their heads into the hole the snake would be repulsed and repelled and would not bite them you ought to thank God that he has anointed your head with oil to protect you from some of the snakes that come in your direction you might stick your head in places and they mean to keep Kill you and consume you but your hand has been anointed with oil and because of that your cup thank God for your running over blessing your children are gonna be blessed your grandchildren are gonna be blessed everybody in your life is going to be blessed on your job in your marriage in your finances somebody just shall overflow I anointed my head with oil and my cup runneth over. But I love the promise that he gave to have your back. He says, surely. <laughs> oh, I could preach this right here, but if I felt like it. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. Here's the problem. This is why you've been worried. It's because you simply known that you had a, a God that was in front of you. But what you didn't realize is that God says, I'm going to go before you, but I will not leave your rear guard uncovered. Because even though the enemy has been nipping at your heels and you've been stressed out about it, you've been trying to figure out how you're going to make it. You're going to make it through the season that you're in right now. Well, God says, it's because I'm going to go before you, but I'm going to leave two watchmen behind you. And it's not maybe should or perhaps, but surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life thank God for his goodness thank God for his mercy and thank God that he's got my back when my friends are walk off on me God says I've got your back when your money becomes fleeting and funny God said I got your back when the doctor gives you bad news God says I've got your back y'all don't hear me in here you got a God that's over you you got a God that's in front of you you got a God that's all around you but you got a God that put goodness and mercy behind you surely surely oh surely 
and mercy shall follow me not just today but every day that I wake up in the morning I look over my shoulder and see that my watchmen are still on the wall goodness is behind me the bullet went by your head mercy was behind you you drove by the accident goodness was behind you you walked out of the accident mercy was behind you you lost your job goodness made a way out of no way you lost some family members mercy kept you from going crazy surely surely ah, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life where my praises shout your way out of it you're gonna rest tonight you're gonna have peace tonight your joy is coming back tonight your breakthrough is right here right now shout like you got it thank him in advance lift him like you know him Surely, oh surely, 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 it's gonna happen. You're gonna get the job. The house belongs to you. The increase is already yours. Your credit is turning around. Your children will be fine. Your babies will be saved. Surely, you're coming out of this season. The cancer will be healed. It's not gonna return. Surely, somebody shout surely. Shout yes. Let the redeemed of the Lord shout yes. Make the devil mad and shout yes. Surely. 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 Oh, surely. Surely. You need a recharge. Not because of what you think. You need a recharge because your spirit is empty. You have to make sure your spirit can handle what your flesh has to carry. And if your spirit is empty, fear, fear is killing us. Panic and worry and anxiety and stress and depression are killing us. And it's because our spirit is empty. If you look at the etymology of the word disease, if you break it apart and look at the entire etymology of the word, it, it's really a compound composition of a prefix and a word that breaks down dis, ease. Dis means apart from, separated. Ease is comfort. So dis, ease, your dis, Ease, your uneasiness, your inability to be easy in this moment is causing you to have diseases. And it's because your soul is empty. <laughs> when you walk in faith, you cannot walk in fear at the same time. Fear cancels faith and faith kills fear faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God you need more word in your soul you got to drown out the noise you got to tell the devil be quiet Shh, mm -mm, mute you can't talk to me I'm talking to God right now God's word is talking to me you can't no 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 Shh, be quiet you don't have authority to define my tomorrow you can't dictate the terms of my eternity. You don't have authority to tell me what's next for me. I know my, my life is in the hands of a God who has predestined me. And he's given me assurances and promises. And because of his promises, you can't tell me what I won't have. You don't have the right to tell me what I cannot do. In Philippians 4.13, God told me himself, out of his own mouth, I can do all things. You can't tell me what won't happen. 
And I'm not going to let the worry about what you said give me dis-ease. I'm not going to be stressed out. I'm not, I'm not going to make myself sick worrying about what you can't see. You got to stop looking with your eyes and start looking with your faith. We walk by faith and not by you can't see it because you're looking in the flesh. Ooh, but if you could see what God is about to do in your life in the spirit. If you knew what he was about to walk you into. If you could see the increase and the favor that was about to fall in your family. If you knew what he was about to do for your children's children's children. If you could see the benefit and the blessing of the bloodline that you carry. If you knew what God was about to do. The devil wouldn't have a chance to arrest you. Because you would spend most of your time in worship and praise and thanksgiving. For what the Lord is about to do in you. As a matter of fact. As a matter of fact I don't want to stop you. I'm not going to push you, but I don't want to stop you either. Some of you can already see that God is about to do a new thing in your life. I will restore unto you everything that the locust has stolen, everything that the canker worms have eaten, the palmer worms. God says, I will do a new thing in you. Any man be in Christ is a new creature. Old stuff is power. You see it. So don't wait on your neighbor. Praise God on the level of your expectation. I ain't talking about them. Surely, praise God like it's surely going to happen. Thank him like it's surely already done. Oh, you act like you don't know it. Oh, no, 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 that's halfway. No, I mean, turn it up like your children will be millionaires. Turn it up like your health is about to turn around. Turn it up like the cancer will be healed. Turn it up like the enemy has already been defeated. Turn it up in this place, surely. Yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. It is well. It is well with my soul. Come on and encourage yourself to say, with my soul. Oh, it is well. It is well we. Clap your hands and know that it is all well. Lord, I thank you for reminding us that you are our shepherd and we shall not want. And even though you have to make us lie down in green pastures so that you can restore our soul. You promise not to leave us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you that even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear the evils that are around us because your rod and your staff are there to comfort us. You promise to be a help. You promise to be a host. You promise to be a haven. That even when we walk through the shadow of death, evil can't come to our dwelling. Thank you that even in the presence of our enemies, you gave us a table and you anoint our head with oil. The creed and declare that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. But there won't be one day that we're uncovered. Not one day that we're unshielded from the attacks of the enemy. That you didn't even just give us a front guard. You gave us a rear guard. Thank you that you have our backs. And thank you for reminding us that we need to rest in you. Some of us have been sleeping, but we haven't been resting. Some of us have been taking vacations, but we haven't been resting. We took the worry with us and we worried when it got back. Some of us, God, have been worried about things that we can't even control. And it really has been an attack on our faith. The enemy has convinced us that you're not in control. So today we take authority over our thoughts. We cast down every vain imagination. We pull it down beneath our feet. We trample and trod over it because truth 
shall stand and prevail until the very end of the age. Help us, God, to replenish and refresh and revive our souls. We've been empty, worried about things that the enemy has given us to worry about. But we hand it back to him tonight. Give it back to him today. Hand it back to him this week, this moment, this hour, this, this day. We give it back to him. And we stand on your promises, which are yes and amen. No weapon that has ever been formed against us will be able to prosper. Greater is he that is in us than anything we got to deal with in this world. The suffering that we're going through now, your glory is going to trump that. That even God, when we come out of this moment, victory belongs to you, to us, because of you. So we don't have to wait till we see it because you already said it in advance for what you are about to do in us, with us, to us, for us, and through us. We shout hallelujah. Come on, every believing heart shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, and amen. Glory to his name. If you are here today and you desire to have a relationship with Jesus, it starts right there. Don't miss this moment. Nothing in your life is going to work the way it should and could without Jesus as your Savior and in your heart. How do I do that? According to Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. God says, I want all to be saved, that none are lost. I came and gave my life for you to have the gift of abundant life here and everlasting life in eternity. What gives you that blessed assurance is knowing that you are in Christ Jesus, that your soul is secure. And I don't want anything less than God wants for you today. That is that your soul is secure, that you can rest in this assurance. And even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death in this life, you don't have to fear. You got a God who claims you as his own and you become his child. Thank God in advance that he's about to do a new thing in you. Everybody stand, say this prayer with me. Say, Lord, thank you for this day and for preserving my life for this very moment. Say, I admit I am a sinner, but I'm so grateful that you forgive me. I believe that you were born. I believe you died. And by faith, I believe you were raised from the dead. So with this confession, I'm excited to say, I am saved. Somebody praise God for salvation. If you pray that prayer for the first time, text us, text the word saved to 844-334-1191. 844-334-1191. Text the word saved. If you're joining me in the chat room, you know how to click the button. They're going to get your information. We want to equip you. It is not easy to walk this life. You need encouragement and we want to be the encouragement that God gives you. Please give us a chance to love you to life and to welcome you into the body of believers. Somebody celebrate those who are saved on today. Come on, that's what we're here for. That's what it's all about.